I'm Dr. Kundo Lose. I'm a vascular surgeon and head of the Department of Vascular Surgery here in Azit Simblasius in Dendermonde, a small city in Belgium. So, you know, we are living today in a, in a world where there is uh, a lot uh, of treatments based on drug eluting technologies. And um, I'm 100% an enthusiast of drug eluting technologies. But I notice in my daily practice, and especially also in the more complex lesions, that I also still uh, need a lot of bare metal stents. I'm thinking, for instance, as a bayload post drug balloon use. We all know the more complex the lesion, the more bailout stenting you need. And also, quite recently, and, and confirmed in the capsicum trial coming from uh, Japan, we noticed also if you have a very laborious uh, recanalization process, um, supintimal, bidirectional, antigrade, retrograde, big loop, supintimal, and so on, we notice that uh, probably the use of drug eluting technologies can create uh, um, aneurysm formation uh, or the important degeneration of the vessel wall. And so in these kind of situations, I also try nowadays uh, to avoid uh, the use of drug eluting uh, technologies and I switch again to bare metal stents. And so in these particular uh, uh, indications, I think that the use and the need for a modern generation of bare metal stents is uh, really a, a, a very important uh, issue. Yes, so in this context, if we are speaking about a, a modern generation of a bare metal stent, bare metal nitinol self-expandable stent, well then, we need uh, 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 some important characteristics. Of course, visibility is for me extremely important. If we want to do a precise placement, you need to see your stent, at least uh, without using too much X-ray and radiation. Uh, secondly, if there is for one or another reason, not an optimal placement, well, it should be nice if you can reposition your stand. So uh, uh, recapturing the stand and reposition it in a better way. Of course, we all know that uh, a good balance of forces, uh, I'm thinking on the crush resistance, on the radial resistive force and the chronic outward force is of course an absolute must in a modern generation of uh, bare metal stand. We need to have a broad range uh, of uh, sizes um, available. And I notice also in Congresses, in live cases, that more and more physicians are using um, distal embolic protection devices, not only in carotid disease, but also in a peripheral arterial disease. Well, if we can have uh, an a device that is also implementing, uh, in, 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 let's say, kind of embolic protection uh, should, uh, would be very great. And when we are taking all these characteristics together, we are coming out in the specific ransom uh, stand. So an uh, interwoven nitinol self-expandable stand of uh, Terimo, where there is also a dual layer available, a micro mesh is uh, in the inner side of the stand in order to avoid uh, protrusion of material uh, through the struts of the stand and avoiding distal uh, embolization. The stand is perfectly uh, repositionable. It's a monorail, uh, uh, it's a rapid exchange uh, stand delivery system, um, what is very comfortable. There are extremely good markers on the stand and in the undeployed state and in the deployed state. And in my opinion, for an interwoven stand, we know there is a competitor on the market with a quite complex um, delivery system if you are not used to it. Well, here you have the classical uh, push and pull uh, delivery technique uh, where it is rather easy uh, to deploy the stand in the correct way. The repositionability is uh, present here with this device, uh, so I think it is uh, fulfilling all the characteristics that I summarized uh, earlier during this uh, question. So with this particular Ransom stand, um, there was uh, the initiative of Terimo to set up a prospective 
multi-center post-market single arm study to confirm, of course, the performance of this uh, RENS and peripheral stent system in patients with femoropopliteal uh, disease. The endpoints in the trial are uh, a safety endpoint, freedom from that TLR, any amputation of the index limb at 30 days, and a primary efficacy endpoint in terms of primary patency uh, defined at uh, one year, core lab uh, controlled. The goal of the study is to enroll 135 patients all over Europe in um, uh, 15 European uh, centers. Um, all patients, uh, actually Claudicans and also uh, 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 critical limb ischemia patients up to uh, uh, Rutherford 5 are allowed. Lesion lengths between 4 and 14 centimeter in terms of length and four to seven millimeters in terms of uh, uh, diameter. So these are the most important, of course, beside a bunch of other in an exclusion criteria, but nothing special uh, related to a FEMPOP study. Um, these are the most important, uh, let's say, uh, definitions in the PRIZER study. So right at the moment, uh, there are uh, 68 enrollments out of uh, the planned 135. And so uh, at the 1st of July, uh, we made a, a snapshot, let's say, of the uh, first 60 patients that are uh, enrolled in the study. And so we have the patient lesion characteristics in this um, um, first cohort, preliminary cohort of uh, 60 patients. Um, so, um, in terms of lesion characteristics, we are talking about uh, lesions of almost 7 cm in length, what is quite uh, classical for this type of uh, uh, studies. A reference vessel diameter of 5.6, completely normal in the fem femoropopliteal tract. And um, we notice um, also, um, let's say, the presence of calcium in 50% of uh, the cases. When we are looking at the, um, let's say, the, 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 the patient characteristics, um, we notice that uh, the majority of the patients are severe uh, claudicans, um, uh, but there is also a substantial amount of, um, let's say, um, critical limb ischemia patients, 18% of these first 60% cohort um, is an... Uh, uh, critical limb ischemia, Rutherford 5 uh, patient. And so when we are diving into the data, uh, we have two types of data. First of all, patient level data, where we notice that we reached a, a safety endpoint at 30 days, freedom from that TLR or limb amputation in 97% of the cases. So 58 patients were doing extremely well. Um, there was... Um, one that you unfortunately uh, to the malignant COVID-19 uh, infection and there was one uh, TLR due to an acute stent thrombosis and uh, uh, revascularized afterwards. Um, there were also some uh, other procedure related complications. There was one distal embolization without any, um, let's say, uh, negative influence or, or consequences for the patient was treated with thrombus aspiration in a very efficient way. And there was also one uh, major bleeding at the access site, a major in terms of requiring transfusion, but at the end also no uh, um, major issue afterwards for the patient anymore. Um, on the other side, beside the, the patient level data, we have also the technical uh, level data, let's say, we asked all the interventionalists um, to, um, let's say, to judge uh, the stent deployment in terms of pushability, um, easiness of the deployment, the visibility of the stent, the uh, precise placement and the radial forces. And so uh, uh, we noticed that in the majority of the cases, the technical uh, uh, judgment of the interventionalists and the enrollers was extremely well with perfect visibility in the majority of the cases, uh, easy deployment, very good uh, pushability without resistance. So the initial data on the technical field are also um, very optimistic. 
But of course, we have only the data now in 60 uh, patients, so a relatively small cohort, also with a relatively short follow-up. I need to see the efficacy at one year in a substantial cohort of patients. Um, but if these data that we notice now in terms of safety, in terms of the easiness of use of this device are confirmed in the uh, further enrollment during this uh, PRIZER study, well, I think then we have a new kit on the block. We have a fantastic interwoven stand that is very easy uh, to implant, uh, that is predictable where you implant it, that is repositionable, and that is also answering the need for protection against distal embolization. So for me, it's going to be uh, also, again, a new uh, generation bare metal stand that is entering in a safe and efficient way uh, in the market, a market where there is still the need for the use of bare metal stands. But as I've mentioned, one condition, if these preliminary results are confirmed on the longer run and in the bigger cohort, the 135 patients in the PRIZER study. Well, the next steps, of course, as I've mentioned, uh, we continue with this uh, uh, PRIZER study up to the 135th patient. We try to have a perfect follow-up um, and, and perfect ECRF platform so that we have all the information on patient-level data and on technical characteristics. And once this is uh, confirming the preliminary data we have, uh, then I think we need to um, extend the population that we are treating, I've mentioned in the beginning, in the end, in an exclusion criteria discussion, we have uh, lesions between four and 14 centimeter. Of course, this is not my daily practice. Um, I want to have also a device that is working in 20, 25, 35 centimeter lesions. So I think the next step is to open it to an all comers registry and to see if we can use this fantastic Ransen stand also in daily life practice.